This talk on the uh, time preference theory of interest and its critics. Um, so I've divided the uh, time between, uh, well, I guess just as the topic goes, right? <laughs> between the two, uh, uh, first just a uh, introductory development of the idea of time preference and its uh, importance in, uh, in uh, economic theory. <clears throat> And then in the second part, we'll deal with the uh, critics, uh, but we're gonna deal with the critics in a uh, positive way um, by looking at how they try to solve the interest rate problem that was posed by Eugen von Bumbabwerk. So he very famously um, introduced this, this avenue of uh, uh, debate or uh, argument uh, with respect to uh, the question of the rate of interest. And it's, uh, well, it's interesting to uh, see how different uh, authors have attempted to, uh, you know, in different traditions, have attempted to uh, meet this challenge. How, how do you, how do you uh, uh, wrestle with this uh, interest rate problem that was posed by uh, Bumbavur? So that'll be the second half. Now, let me remind you of uh, what we've covered uh, up to this point. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in economic theory. Right? We've uh, talked about um, uh, the capital structure and production processes and law of returns and all these uh, technical aspects of uh, production. Uh, we've, of course, talked about um, valuing and um, uh, imputation of value so that we see how value moves from the uh, judgments we make in our minds to the consumer goods to the producer goods and how all the different production processes are organized, uh, especially important in the, in the social setting, uh, in order to uh, direct resources to ends that we uh, value most highly. So we've covered the uh, pricing and appraisement, economic calculation, right, all of these uh, uh, um, aspects of um, uh, making a, an argument and showing how the market economy accomplishes this economizing task. But there's one thing that we haven't yet uh, done that's really essential to uh, the whole apparatus of uh, explanation of how the market works, and that is the element of time. And so we'll proceed in the same way we did with um, uh, valuing and appraisement. We need to proceed by starting with the uh, mental judgments that we make with respect to time and what those are and uh, you know, what the universal principles of uh, uh, valuing with respect to time happen to be. And then we'll talk about how that move, uh, or leads to uh, pricing in the market. So, so that's, the, that's the task of, uh, of the beginning part of the talk. <clears throat> so let's start by making a basic distinction between temporal aspects of action and intertemporal. <clears throat> So the temporal aspects of action deal with the timing of action. They deal with the placement of an action in time, the moment that we take an action. Should I do the action today, tomorrow, the next day? If I'm going to do it today, should I do it in the morning or the afternoon or the evening? So on and so forth, right? This is a choice variable for us uh, as human beings. We can, we can uh, choose to place the action at a particular moment in time as opposed to another moment in time. Now, why would we do this? Well, obviously, we would do this because we think that there is some uh, advantage. There's some greater value from taking the action at one moment in time as opposed to another. It's the same reason we do any action, right? We see that there are two alternatives, and one we judge is more valuable and the other less valuable. So we see that, you know, uh, e eating lunch at, uh, at, uh, after this talk is more valuable than eating lunch before the talk because we can hang out with each other and, and uh, you know, have great discussions. And that, you know, is part of the experience, right? The conditions under which the action takes place are different at that moment. And so it uh, em embellishes the, the marginal utility we get from the act, right? Or, or from the good that we're uh, acting with. So that's the basic idea of temporal allocation. <clears throat> now, uh, does the does temporal allocation lead to or temporal assessment? Does this lead to any uh, pricing in the market? And uh, well, yeah, sure, it leads to forward prices. So people can speculate or anticipate today what they think the price of a good will be in the future or at some moment in the future. 
And then they can uh, trade based upon their different uh, entrepreneurial judgments as to you know, what that future price will be. So temporal uh, considerations, the, the, the uh, judgment that we make subjectively of what we think the value of something will be at this moment in time versus that moment are the uh, underlying principle from which we get forward prices. Now, we're not gonna deal with forward prices because these are not interest rates. And the, and the talk is about interest rates, right? That's the whole point of going over this a little bit, just to see that we can make this distinction clearly between forward prices and interest rates. But for those of you who are not familiar with this, um, this area of economic uh, analysis, forward prices are uh, agreements that people make today. Two parties will make an agreement today to trade a good at a price at some moment in the time that they stipulate today, right? That's called the forward transaction. That's the forward price. <clears throat> now, what we know about forward prices is that they lead, uh, they lead to temporal efficiency in the allocation of the good. So let's say today we have a futures market in oil, and a lot of the speculators think that um, oil is going to become more scarce, uh, you know, uh, geopolitical, uh, uh, happenings will occur and the oil will be cut off from Iran or whatever and uh, you know in the next few months and then the, so the oil price is going to be sky high in six months and so they've got they've got this six month you know the expectation of this price way up here in six months and yet today it's down here right and so if they make if they can make forward contracts with each other then that price becomes public just like the spot price, it becomes a public public knowledge, right? And now, if we, we've got this price sky high up here, that it seems to be what the speculators are anticipating, and and the, today's price down here, then the actual then the people who are actually involved in the production and allocation of oil will know to allocate the oil into the future. So they'll just build up stores of it, right, and not sell it today. They'll reduce the supply today, hold it off the market, and deliver the supply. Uh, in anticipation, they'll deliver the supply in the future when the price is higher. This arbitraging will bring the prices together, which means we've got a more efficient allocation temporally now of the good. We've moved it from where it's lower valued to where it's higher valued in time. This is a, a part of the efficiency of the market. <clears throat> okay, but aside from that, we won't go into any more about uh, forward transactions and this temporal allocation. <clears throat> because time preference, uh, our topic, uh, doesn't deal with temporal uh, allocation and the timing of goods, it deals with a different aspect of time. And this is how we define time preference then. It's the satisfaction uh, of an end sooner is preferred to the same satisfaction later. So that's how we define time preference. And we'll deal with some of the nuances of the definition and, and so forth as we go along in, in the second half where some of the critics uh, come in. But here we'll, we'll just stick with this as the definition. This is the preferred definition, if you will. <clears throat> and as uh, Ludwig von Mises emphasized, this uh, idea of time preference then is embedded in the human condition. This is not a psychological disposition that some people have, like being impatient or something like that. Um, impatience, of course, could, uh, or psychological factors could affect the rate of our time preference. So. That, that's a, a different issue, right? But the, but the existence of time preference, of always preferring a sooner satisfaction of a given end to a later satisfaction, is embedded in human nature. <clears throat> By the way, the companion principle of this we've already seen, right? We didn't put it this way, but the very idea of, um, of uh, preferring more of a good to less of a good is bound up in the finitude of the human condition. It's bound up in the scarcity of, of the human condition. Right? We, we must, in fact, prefer more of a good to less of a good. That, that there can't be exceptions to this. This is embedded in the human condition. The same is true of time preference. Because we're temporal beings, it must be the case that we always prefer the sooner satisfaction to the same satisfaction later. This, this is just in, in, embedded in the uh, nature of being temporal. So, so this is the point, right? Time preference then is not a not like an ancillary thing. It's a fundamental feature of all human action, just like preference is. It's important to grasp this uh, point. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, the, the time preference then, if we want to say this in a slightly different way, it would mean that there would be a premium that we would place on the present. The present satisfaction is preferred to the future satisfaction. And so there's a, uh, a premium that we would place on the present satisfaction uh, compared to the future. And then since this is part of the human condition, it, it, uh, it, it's involved in all instances of, uh, of action. Well, that have a time dimension. I mean, one might imagine uh, action that has an insignificant time dimension, where time preference might not uh, be relevant. But aside from that, it's always involved. Uh, we're always assessing the trade-off of alternatives, not just in terms of our preference for one thing for another, but also in terms of our time preference. Uh, th this is a, a element of all of all of action. The other thing to stress here at the very beginning is that, like preference itself, time preference is always forward-looking. We're, we're, we're always assessing, uh, uh, anticipating the, uh, the uh, value that we'll obtain from one alternative versus another in our preferences. We're always assessing the sooner satisfaction versus the later satisfaction of something with respect to, uh, before we act, right, with respect to... Uh, uh, the future, how, how it would work out um, if we take one course of action versus another. <clears throat> then we get, so what, uh, how does this manifest itself on, uh, in pricing? Well, this generates then what, what uh, Mises likes to call the originary rate of interest, or what we might more simply call the pure rate of interest. So the pure rate of interest then would be important in uh, determining intertemporal allocation of things. The time structure of production, then, is the most important uh, application of time preference. This is not a temporal question, right? When should I produce the steel or something? It's, it's the structure of the stages of production and how they're, how they're organized. And we mine iron and produce steel and then uh, you know, um, manufacture parts for automobiles and then assemble the car. Will, will, this, will this structure of production, how much time will it take, will elapse between the start of the production process and the consumption of the good? Right? It's an intertemporal question. <clears throat> uh, okay, so uh, we, get, we get the uh, manifestation of time preference in the market uh, economy would be what, again, we'll call the pure rate of interest. <clears throat> so we can trace the pure rate of interest back to the uh, judgments of the human mind. So we gave this uh, schematic, uh, remember, uh, on Monday. Uh, the, the first line then is the, was the first part of the schematic where we said, you know, their preferences and then people based upon their preferences for things would have demand for goods and supply of the goods. And then when they meet and trade, the, the price would emerge that clears the market. So, so that's the top line that we've covered already. So the same argument would be applied then to time preference. Uh, some people have more intense time preference, what we call higher time preference. They want present satisfaction more urgently than other people compared to future satisfactions. And some people have less intense time preference. They have lower time preference, as we say. And so these two people, uh, two groups of people can meet and uh, mutually satisfy their time preferences. The low time preference people can lend to present money to the high time preference people. And both of them have their preferences satisfied then. The borrowers are willing to pay interest rates that the lenders are willing to accept. And we get mutual satisfaction. So the pure rate of interest would, would be uh, established at the point that clears the what we call the time market for the trade of present money for future money. This is how the, the argument would run out. Okay, We'll look at some other details of this in a minute. And then on the next line, I just want to remind you that the pure rate of interest then would be the discount of the discounted marginal re revenue product of factors of production. So when entrepreneurs are considering how much am I willing to pay today to hire this worker who's going to work for me and generate, uh, you know, help generate some output in the future that I can sell, they'll want to know how physically productive is this worker. They'll want to know what uh, revenue will be generated by this physical productivity, the marginal revenue product. And if they're going to pay in advance, of course, they, they're going to discount their payment. 
So they're going to get the revenue from the sale of the output in the future, but they're going to have to pay the worker now, let's say over the next year before the output is sold. <clears throat> so the demand that entrepreneurs have for um, uh, factors of production, if they're paying in advance, if they're paying up front before the output is sold, would then be the discounted marginal revenue product. And this, again, we had on the big schematic uh, on Monday, but you know we didn't go into the details of that uh, particular uh, element, right? What, what determines the demand that entrepreneurs have for factors of production? Then the prices of the producer goods, the prices of the factors of production, would be determined by the interplay of the of supply and demand. Right? So we have the owner, we have the workers who own the their labor, and they offer the labor, and we have the entrepreneurs who are demanding it based on their estimate of the discounted marginal revenue products, and then the pr uh, factor prices, the wages would emerge to clear that labor market. Right? So you can see that the, the there's an interest return built into production. This is the point. The, the entrepreneur is always assessing the giving up of present money to pay for the factors of production in anticipation of getting future money from that investment, right, uh, by uh, selling the output uh, eventually to the consumer. Uh, so that so that's a, a basic element of this uh, pricing structure. <clears throat> okay, so this is how it would look like in the, uh, again, what we call the time market or what Murray Rothbard calls the time market. We had the high time preference people who are demanding uh, present money, uh, borrowers, and then low time preference people who are lending or supplying the present money. And then they, they just come together in markets, the uh, standard argument, and um, the market clearing, you know, they trade at the market clearing price. I remember the argument here is that they trade at the market clearing price because that's the price at which all the preferences of the people involved are satisfied. And so, so that price is superior to any other price. And so people are aiming at that, right? They're uh, imposing that or setting that, however you want to say it. <clears throat> so this is what would determine the pure rate of interest. Notice then the pure rate of interest, just like the price of any good, is, is completely determined by subjective valuations. G given our circumstances, right? And we're always in certain circumstances of action, but given that, uh, the, the existence of the price and its level and so on are um, traceable back to nothing but how people subjectively value action within their given situation. That's it. This is what the argument uh, of time preference and its relationship to the rate of interest, uh, the Austrian tradition says. <clears throat> okay, now another thing we want to mention here is that, uh, and this becomes uh, important again in uh, the debate, the critics, um, so we want to emphasize this. The intertemporal trade, uh, this trade of present money uh, uh, for future money, is always in money, not in goods. There, there's no intertemporal trade that people engage in in kind, in barter goods. We don't make uh, loans in, uh, uh, you know, apples or men's dress shoes or auto factories or, right? Hopefully you see right away why we wouldn't do this. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's some maybe even more obvious reasons why we wouldn't do this, but uh, but the uh, because you know these goods are not a general medium of exchange, right? We just prefer that. But but there's a, a sort of a somewhat hidden theoretical reason why this is so. <clears throat> if we if we were to try to if people were to try to make intertemporal exchanges in kind in goods. Then they would not be. There would be no assurance that they could separate out in this intertemporal trade the time preference element of their trade from the temporal elements. What if we tried to make uh, lending and borrowing in oil? Well, but then if we do this, we've got the problem that when the loan is going to be paid off in the future, the oil could have a different price, right? Because the consumption or production demand for it. It, 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 the conditions of it are varied from where they are today. And so well, we, can't, we can't then make a pure intertemporal trade with goods because we, we couldn't be sure that we were doing this. But we can with money. This is because money is neither a producer good nor a consumer good. It's the medium of exchange. 
and a unit of the medium of exchange is equally serviceable with every other unit. Just like I wouldn't care which dollar bill I, uh, or I guess it'd be a $5 bill that I take to buy a cup of coffee in the morning. I don't, I don't have a differential preference for one over the other, right? They're completely equally serviceable, every unit of money. And so every unit of money, even intertemporally, has this uh, equally serviceable character to it. Now, again, we'll see there are nuances to this that we have to chase down, but, but hopefully you can see that there, there's something different here. There's something special about money that allows a, a intertemporal trade to be done in money, isolating the, this time preference element, isolating the pure rate of interest. Now, now again, there are nuances that we'll chase down in just a minute on this. <clears throat> okay, so this is the, this is the point. Uh, now, this is a point of debate, and again, we'll take up the, some of the points uh, as we go through the second half. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so uh, then we want to we emphasize this, uh, this additional point. I'm going to make sure we're, uh, we completely see the uh, scope of the argument here by breaking down the time market into its uh, basic components. So if we think about the categories of people lending present money in, in exchange for uh, future money, <clears throat> we can uh, break down the, the uh, time market into two basic subcategories. They're credit markets. And uh, as Murray Rothbard says, these are credit transactions where we have an overt or explicit uh, loan that's made. And then the credit markets can be further subdivided into consumer loan markets and producer loan markets. And then consumer loan markets could be further broken down as they would be in a, you know, in a kind of a practical application into the various goods that are bought with the borrowed money. So we have mortgage markets for people who buy houses. We have auto loan markets, right, buying cars. We have general merchandise markets and credit card markets and so on. And a similar thing for producer loans. So we, we would have, um, you know, prime, uh, uh, we had a, a prime uh, interest uh, market we would have uh, collateralized uh, uh, loans, uh, 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 you know, bonds that could be offered, right, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so, so that that's how we would uh, give a topology theoretically to provide a framework for explaining all of this diversity within the within the credit markets, right? <clears throat> and then there's a the capital structure. So, as I suggested already, entrepreneurs advance money to owners of the factors of production. And for this, they need to earn a rate of interest. Otherwise, they won't advance the money. <laughs> they, they would just lend it out on credit markets, right? So it's, they're in business. And so they, they uh, need to uh, generate this rate of return <clears throat> for making the investment. And we've seen already how this is done. They obtain this uh, interest return by paying the uh, workers and the uh, factor owners the discounted marginal revenue product of their factor. And then when the good is sold, they earn the marginal revenue product, right? They earn the full monetary value of the productivity of the worker. And they pay the worker the, the, the discounted value they, because they're lending the worker money in advance. So, so this is the idea um, of uh, you know, how, where the uh, interest rate uh, comes, comes from in the capital structure. And the other point uh, here uh, that I have on the slide is that the pure rate of interest then would be uniform across all, there'd be arbitrage again that would make, just like there, we talked about the arbitrage in the forward prices, there would be arbitrage across all the different investable activities that would um, uh, keep the pure rate of interest the same across all, in, uh, all of these different investable projects. Again, we'll talk about a nuance with respect to that in a minute. <clears throat> but if entrepreneurs could earn 10% by you know, investing their uh, funding into, uh, let's say, uh, uh, oil, uh, shale oil, and 5% uh, in, uh, uh, you know, just regular uh, uh, pool oil or whatever they call it, <clears throat> uh, then they would begin to shift their investment away from the low interest to the higher interest areas, right? And again, this would bring the interest returns in those two areas together. As they bid more for the factors of production, they'd raise their prices shrink the uh, net income and so on. So <clears throat> this is just, again, the normal process of uh, efficiency 
in the allocation of resources uh, in the market economy. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that's, uh, so we need this detail in order to again uh, proceed. And now let's get to this final uh, point on the uh, time preference, uh, this kind of introductory material on time preference. And this is what I mentioned, I was mentioning before about the nuances. Okay, so we have this notion of the pure rate of interest that is the uh, manifestation of time preference. But the market rates of interest, as we've already seen, uh, aren't always the same. So mortgage interest rates aren't the same as credit card interest rates. Uh, AAA corporate bond rates aren't the same as junk bond rates. Um, uh, the rate of return on uh, fracking is not the same as the rate of return on running a bakery and so on and so forth. Well, where, do, where does all that diversity come from then if we said before that arbitrage tends to make the pure rate of interest the same? Okay, well, it comes from other factors, obviously, that are uh, peculiar to these different classes of investments. And so, uh, again, uh, Ludwig von Mises has a nice uh, presentation of this in Human Action, where he says it's not just the pure rate of interest, but it's also the duration of the investable project, right? So longer duration investable projects tend to command higher interest rates than shorter ones <clears throat> because people's time preferences are... Uh, more readily satisfied in shorter, as we said before, sooner as opposed to later, right? So if you're going to convince people to lend to you for even later payback, the, the, uh, the uh, a premium is higher. This, this would be the argument. And second, there's entrepreneurial uncertainty. So these different lines of investment can have different uh, degrees of entrepreneurial difficulty in uh, uh, anticipating the future accurately. And if they do, then the uh, funds that are lent, you know, the entrepreneurs that are uh, borrowing funds or plowing their own funds into these projects that are more uncertain, have a greater degree of uncertainty, so we don't really know quite as well if it's going to pay off, would have to command higher interest rates uh, to draw the funds into those lines of activity than lines of activity where entrepreneurial uncertainty is more manageable. Then there's what uh, Mises calls the price premium. The price pre premium comes from Cantillon effects through monetary inflation. So you've heard explanations of this already, right? We get a monetary inflation comes into the hands of people in the economy, uh, particular people in particular places at particular time. And so they can buy the things that they want and the prices of those things will rise first. And then the producers of the goods whose prices are rising will get more income and then they'll buy the things that they want and the prices of those things go up and so on and with sort of ripples uh, throughout the economy <clears throat> and it could be that a an entrepreneur is producing in a um, market where he's close to the first users of the money if so the after the fact the rate of return is going to be higher than than he you know otherwise right and so this is what mises calls the price premium and then finally, there are unanticipated changes in the purchasing power of money. This is where we get to the nuance I mentioned before about the equal serviceability of a unit of money across time. It's quite obvious that there's equal serviceability of a unit of money uh, across markets in the present, right? But that's because the purchasing power of the unit of money would have to be the same because I'm, I'm either going to, you know, I'm going to spend it right now, but I'm going to spend it on this good versus that good, right? Purchasing power of money over time doesn't have to be the same, does it? The purchasing power of money in the future, again, could be lower or higher than it is in the present. So if I'm going to make a loan contract, I have to take account of that, right? I have to think in my, uh, in my mind and make an entrepreneurial judgment what I think the uh, purchasing power of the money is going to be when I'm paid back if compared to the purchasing power of the money that I'm offering today, right? <laughs> now, if people, as Murray Rothbard pointed out, if people, if all people in the market, in the uh, a time market, if everybody in the time market perfectly anticipates the future purchasing power of money, <clears throat> then there'll be no uh, unanticipated uh, element. There'll be no purchasing power element in the interest rate because they'll act uh, today perfectly in response to that to that uh, instance, right? <clears throat> and this, this premium then would, uh, part of it would be, this fourth part would be washed away. But if it's unanticipated, then it will remain, right? So if some people have better anticipation of what the future purchasing power of money is going to be than other people, 
then then this premium will rise in the in the market rate of interest. So in periods of higher rates of price inflation, it, uh, market interest rates tend to be higher because they have this premium built into them because not everybody in the market anticipates that the correct degree of price inflation. Right? So that that's another nuance, right? <clears throat> so that's the manner in which then the purchasing power of money is corrected, so to speak. Uh, the differences in the purchasing power of money are uh, accounted for in the assessment that we make intertemporally about taking present money and paying back future money or lending present money and receiving back future money. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go on to the, to the second part. This is uh, Boombavrik's uh, interest rate problem. <clears throat> and so this is the problem. Why is the price of a capital good not bid up by investors or entrepreneurs? Uh, to equal the sum of its lifetime marginal revenue products. If I know that I can buy a plot of land, let's say, that uh, you know, generates, uh, uh, it's a farmland, and it uh, generates uh, an income of uh, $10,000. Know, I've got 100 acres or whatever, and it generates that income. And, and I think, well, it's going to keep generating that income as long as I you know, tend to it properly, I husband the land properly. It's going, to take, uh, it's going to generate that income for me next year and year after that, and year after that, year after that, year after that, year after that. So why, as an investor, would I not pay you know, the, the full future revenue stream to get that, to get that land today? That, that's, the, that's the question, right? We know that the price of the land will be finite not infinite, as it would be if there were no interest rate. The price of the land is going to be finite. But why, why doesn't it, you know, so if I can buy the land, if I can buy this 100 acres for um, $120,000, and it generates all, and everybody knows it's, or has a reasonable expectation, there, you know, um, there's a, a sort of reasonable spectrum of expectations with respect to what it's going to do in the future. Why doesn't another entrepreneur just step in and outbid me and pay 130000 140,000, 150,000, why not? What, what stops them from doing this, right? That's, the, that's a very puzzling question. I mean, there's a very excellent way of proceeding on this uh, line um, of inquiry about the interest rate. So the, the, uh, to put the point the other way around, the owner of capital then receives a permanent income from owning the capital. Once they, once they own the capital, they get, they get this income that just comes to them, right? It seems to be anomalous uh, element in the market. It doesn't seem to be it just uh, it's a surplus income. And why should anybody get a surplus income? And you can see that the Marxists jump on this, right? So we'll we'll deal with them as a one one critic. Now we've already seen the answer to that uh, Boombavrik gave and that the Austrians give. Uh, PT PT is pure time preference theory. So the pure time preference theory says that the surplus. Uh, um, uh, income uh, comes from the discount. If I'm going to buy the land, I have to pay today. And if I pay $150,000 today, well, I could have invested the $150,000 in the credit markets on interest and I could get this income, right? I could generate that income. So uh, if I'm going to pay $150,000 for the land today, I have to generate the same income. So, so, so that's the idea, right? We pay, we, the entrepreneurs pay only the discounted marginal revenue product stream to buy the capital good, but they earn the marginal revenue product, just like they do for all factors of production. So this is not puzzling or anomalous or anything. This is what uh, happens, uh, 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 this is one uh, area where the capitalist entrepreneur generates income. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let's uh, okay, uh, go to the, uh, the critics. Uh, so this is the, the exploitation theory of interest. Uh, you may remember in reading some uh, Austrian literature that uh, Boombavrik uh, smashed this to pieces, right? The, um, uh, the labor theory of value and the, the exploitation theory of interest um, was dead from the neck up uh, after Boombavrik uh, uh, wrote about it in the, in the late 19th century. As he pointed out, this argument is uh, based upon the, this fallacious labor theory of value, which we won't go into the fallacies of it. Um, and as Boombavrik pointed out, labor is in fact paid its full value. It's, it, it, they're not, it isn't exploitation. It's, that's just wrong-headed to think this. 
And we can see this quite readily uh, in, in a, you know, a simple um, thought experiment where we ask the question, um, what, if late, uh, what if the workers, instead of being paid up front, what if they just waited for their pay? What if they waited until the good was sold and then got their pay? Then how much would it be? And the answer is, well, then it would be its full marginal revenue product. Or to put the case slightly differently, what if, they took, what if workers took their upfront pay and then lent it out on interest until the good was sold? <laughs> then they'd have the full marginal revenue product of their, of their services, right? So this is not exploitation. This is just, it's lending and borrowing, right? The workers have higher time preference. The entrepreneur has lower. And they're just mutually satisfying their time preferences. And there's no exploitation involved. <clears throat> okay, the productivity theory. <clears throat> uh, the productivity theory was uh, advanced uh, 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 next in chron uh, chronologically against the uh, time preference theory. And uh, it, uh, very famous examples of this. So Irving Fisher uh, provided some of this, and then uh, there, there were others, Paul Samuelson, uh, Frank Knight, are famous uh, critics of the pure time preference theory on this ground. And they say, wait a minute, you know, capital just generates a physical flow of output in the future. Capital's physically productive, and the interest rate is just reflecting that physical productivity. And so, so it's not based on subjective value or anything like that. It's, it's, just, it's just a manifestation of the physical productivity of capital. Now, Bumbavrik, again, if you know the Austrian literature, you know Bumbavrik spent an entire volume uh, of his three-volume work on capital and interest. Uh, debunking all of the different variations of these theories, right? There's like, I don't know, 20 variations of the productivity theory. He goes through them all and smashes it one by one, right? So we can't go through, you know, do all that work. So this is kind of a truncated version of this. Um, so the first point then to, to make about, well, the exam let me back up just a second. The example that Irving Fisher gave was, let's suppose we have, um, we have this, uh, a sailor, these sailors on a ship, and they're, they crash on an island, and they're stranded. And then he goes through different scenarios of goods that they have. Sheep is one of them, and so that, that, that's the example I've given here. And then hardtack is another, and then figs is a third. And, and you can see what he's going for. He's saying, look, if you have sheep that reproduce, and then the sheep flock gets bigger, uh, you know, 10% bigger every year, uh, you've got productivity and you would have a positive interest rate, a positive real interest rate, right? If you have hard tack that never de disintegrates and doesn't self-reproduce, well, then you have a zero interest rate in a hard tack world because there's no productivity, right? If you have a fig world, well, the figs deteriorate and you'd have a negative interest rate. This is what he says, right? It's just, he says, you know, this is just obvious and factual result of the, of the uh, physical attributes of of uh, the stipulated conditions. Uh, but as Bumbavrik points out, th this misses the, the point entirely. Of course, nobody doubts that there's physical productivity and there could be uh, then uh, uh, you know, a physical improvement over time or physical uh, status or whatever, physical deteriorate, deterioration. <clears throat> but none of, none of that has anything to do with the, the rate of interest. Again, to take a real example, let's go to the land example again. Land is like the sheep. The problem with the sheep example is it's a one good economy, right? And so you get into all sorts of problems trying to work out the logic of a one good economy, of which there aren't any So, right, in, in the real world. So if you have land, and land is perpetually productive, uh, the rate of return that's earned on an investment in land, though, is independent of that, right? It's completely independent of its physical productivity. It depends only on people's time preferences. It depends only on what people are willing to advance as present money to obtain the future revenue stream that would be generated by that, by that physical productivity. It's just a monetary question, right? <clears throat> and so if it were physically more productive, the, the entrepreneurs would be willing to pay more up front to buy it. And so the rate of return then would be moderated from the real productivity. Or as my example puts it, this is uh, CV is capital value. So if we have land, the capital value, since land is indefinitely productive, we're assuming, the marginal revenue, it's just uh, calculated as the marginal revenue product divided by the interest rate. 
So if we had a land site that generated $10 worth of value at a 10% interest rate, it would have a capital value of $100. Entrepreneurs would be willing to pay $100 up front to get a revenue stream of $10 a year at a 10% rate of return, if the going rate of return is 10%. If the going rate of return is 5%, then they're willing to pay $200 to get a $10 return every year. The capital value adjusts, in other words, to the rate of interest. So that the so that every investable project generates exactly the same rate of interest. This is the problem with productivity theories, or the, at least the fundamental problem with it. <clears throat> okay, what about eclectic theories? This is uh, one variation of the uh, neoclassical theory. This is like the uh, Marshallian scissors uh, that we mentioned briefly in demand and supply analysis for goods. Demand is preferences and supply is uh, cost of production. And the two sort of co-determine uh, the price of a good. This is Marshall's view. And so here's a Marshallian application to, time pr uh, to interest rates. They say demand, yeah, demand for borrowed money is based on time preference. But supply is based upon the productivity of capital. And so the two jointly determine the rate of interest. Now hopefully you can see right away that this has got to be mistaken. If the productivity theory itself is wrong, then this has to be wrong. Because the productivity of capital is uh, uh, whatever its physical productivity, its value productivity is always determined by the going rate of interest. And so to argue this way, you're actually in, engaged in the fallacy of uh, the vicious circle, right? You're arguing in a circle. So, so this is no good. We can toss this out right away. Um, here's Bumbavork's uh, attempt uh, to explain uh, the rate of interest. And Bumbavork makes a uh, critical mm, misstep uh, that uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, uh, noted. Uh, he reintroduces productivity into the argument as fundamental. And so his argument is, yes, yes, it's time preference that determines the demand and supply for, he called it present goods, not money as we've been doing. Present goods, and that determines the rate of interest. And there's subjective factors that enter into time preference, just like we have been saying, right? A person could have high time preference because they're, uh, you know, they're impatient for whatever reason, psychologically, or whatever it might be. Although, uh, Bumbavrik's subjective factor is a little bit more uh, psychologically, psychological claims than, than what I've been claiming. But the, but the basic problem is this value productivity. You can't have value productivity until you know the rate of interest, as we've already suggested. We don't know the value productivity of capital. Um, we don't know what the monetary rate of return is going to be by investing in capital until we know the rate of interest. And, and so Bumbavrik's theory, again, is no good. By introducing that element, he's, he's given up any kind of uh, cause and effect uh, argument for the rate of interest. Um, this theory is also a neoclassical theory <coughs> that has been advanced by uh, several um, uh, authors. <coughs> um, and this is the idea that weighting is a factor of production And the interest rate is the payment to the factor of production we call weighting. Now, by the way, when, when I first heard this theory, I thought, well, okay, you know, that we can kind of, I can sort of uh, accept that premise. If, but I thought what they meant was, in the theory was, that weighting meant actual time. Yeah, th then it sort of, you know, seems plausible. Maybe there's something else wrong with the theory, but th that's not what they mean by waiting, they define waiting as the supply of present money. Waiting is just lending. Okay, well, okay, well, okay. Then, then you, the argument just sort of falls apart, right? Because if what they mean by waiting is lending, then time preference determines waiting. And then waiting, deter yeah, determines the rate of interest along with demand for, for uh, present money. The supply of present money and the demand for present money determine the interest rate. If we want to call the supply of present money waiting, okay, well, that's not really a very, you know, a big advance on economic insight, right? That's not very helpful, actually. Uh, the other thing that we might uh, say against this, you can do this as a homework exercise. This will scramble your brains if you try this, I guarantee you. Try to figure out what the marginal physical product of waiting is. If you define waiting as the supply of uh, credit, what 
And because all neoclassical economists say that, uh, you know, agree with the Austrians, the, they have the marginal productivity theory of factor pricing, right? So if weighting is a factor of production, its price has to be determined by the marginal productivity theory of, of factor pricing. Okay, so that I'll leave that as a homework assignment. For you. <clears throat> okay, Bob Murphy has some criticisms of the pure time preference theory. Uh, this comes from his dissertation. And um, <clears throat> he, he argues this way. He says, look, they're in the literature, and he's quite right about this. In the literature, there are two definitions of time preference. One that we gave at the beginning is in terms of satisfaction. Then another that we saw Boom Bavork uses, and sometimes you see this also in Mises, it's present goods versus future goods. So, so there seems to be this, are they the same or how are they related, right? We have this problem. <clears throat> so Murphy uh, hits on this. He's quite correct to point this out, Professor Mur Murphy says, as a present satisfaction, then, then it's right. Time preference always means a premium of the present. So we can all agree with that. That's, that's not controversial. But as present goods, if we define time preference as present goods, well, then it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, there would be a, a premium on the present, right? There's no, uh, to, have a, to have a subjective premium on the, on the present doesn't generate a, an interest rate in and of itself. And to have present goods will generate a, a, a price, but it, may, it won't be uh, connected to the premium that we have subjectively. There's no reason to think that the two are connected. I and mean, he's quite right about this. We've already seen the solution to this, why this is not a, a very uh, effective criticism. It's because we're not trading present goods for future goods in the, in the time market. We trade present money for future money. And money does, in fact, provide a template upon which we can impress our time preferences purely, right, without this temporal aspect. And so his second uh, criticism is uh, based upon the same kind of uh, distinction. He says, look, uh, time preference as a satisfaction could generate a premium of the present, but it's neither necessary or sufficient because a premium of the present could arise from different marginal utilities of the good, right? Just as we had noticed before when we talked about the timing of things. And the time preference premium could be overcome if we, val if we have a marginal utility of the future good that's much higher than the present good. He's quite right about this. But what he overlooks is the fact that this is precisely the reason, theoretically, that people make uh, 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 time preference related exchanges, intertemporal uh, related exchanges in money and not in goods. Okay, so, that, so again, this criticism sort of is beside the point. And then Dr. Holtzman also has uh, criticisms based upon the same kind of uh, uh, fundamental uh, uh, distinction between time preference as a satisfaction and time preference as present goods versus future goods. So both these criticisms misfire because they don't recognize that um, time preference is always expressed in money, present money versus future money, never goods. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Professor Holtzman's uh, argument is more intriguing, he says, the larger stock of a future good is preferred to a smaller stock of a present good. And because of this, only time preference could explain why we take the present amount, right? That, that's one line of argument, one way to put it. But then he points out that Mises and others in this uh, line of uh, time preference argument also say that a good in the present is a different good from the good in the future. Well, if that's true, then the first line of argument is not, is not correct, is it? It's not certainly correct, right? It doesn't follow logically. If the future good is different from the present good, so what if we have more of it? Maybe it's a lousy good, right? It's a different good. Okay, it could be lousy. He's quite right about this. He is quite right. But again, uh, intertemporal trade is not in goods. It's present money for future money. And, and so it eliminates this, this problem that might arise. And then he says, he uh, again takes another stab at this. He says, time preference is between two options of choice for the same good. He says, this is Mises' view. But he's thinking of a good. He's thinking of a good like an apple. Any good, in other words. And then he says, well, look, you know, if that's his view, then he's got a big problem because the value of an apple six months from now can be, can be different, right? It's not, it's not expressing just time preference. It could be different because of the timing of the apple you know, the circumstances of consuming the apple in the future. He's quite right about this. And Mises is sort of uh, 
not as clear as he could be on this point. He, does, he just sort of interchangeably used this expression of present goods for future goods. But if we stick to money, present money for future money, then this problem goes away. Right? So again, I don't think this is a definitive criticism uh, against the uh, time preference theory, but it's, a, it's very helpful. These criticisms by Professor Murphy and uh, Professor Holzman have been very helpful in sort of clarifying. There's much more work to be done, by the way, for you young scholars in, in this area of clarifying uh, issues with, related to time preference and interest and financial markets and so on and so forth. Uh, so at that point, I'll, uh, I'll stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>